Let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Father, Lord, I just thank you for this evening. God, I just thank you for the rain you've given us. I pray, Father, that you'll continue to bless us. Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to come together and study your word, Father, and know what's going on in our association, Lord. Lord, I just pray that everything we do here tonight will be done to bring glory and honor to you. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, just going over the announcements real quick. Vacation Bible School starts tomorrow at 530. We will not have visitation or outreach tomorrow night. We are canceling that for Bible school. And you know Brother Dale's the visitation for his father is at Kilpatrick's tomorrow at 5. So, but you can go a little earlier than that because his family, they're all going to be there at 4. Okay. So if you're working, you just have to run in and run out, you know. We need you at Bible school if you're a worker. Uh, July the 12th is young at heart. You got a speaker yet? I'll sing for you. <laughs> I, I know that'll draw a crowd, but my voice just seems to be a little scratchy right now. So, uh, next Sunday evening at 5 o'clock, We'll meet in the fellowship hall. We'll have our 4th of July celebration on the 3rd. We'll have snacks and stuff to eat. We'll have board games. They're trying to get some stuff for the kids. So we'll see. Whatever, we'll be together. So we'll have a good time. So y'all plan on that, by the way. All right, let's stand together. Come we that love the Lord. Let's sing it together. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song of sweet accord. Join in a song of sweet accord. And thus surround the throne and thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, beautiful city of God. I didn't do that yet. <laughs> Let those refuse to sing and never knew our God. But children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King. Joys abroad may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every cheer be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's crown. We're marching through Emmanuel's crown to fairer worlds on high, fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, beautiful city of God. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou, if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me, 
and purchase my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee in life. I will love in death and praise thee as long as thou in deathly breath and say If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now in mansions of glory and in blessed delight. I'll prayer at this time if anyone here would like to for us to pray with you pray over you if you're visiting here we have a few visitors here tonight what we do on Sunday nights we pause for just a moment and you know the Bible says if you are sick have need of prayer call for those elders have them come lay hands on you and pray for us that makes us to be honest it makes us sound a little bit charismatic let's just put it out there it just makes us sound a little bit this way <laughs> but uh but you know what the Bible says that's right out of the Bible. And lay hands on each other. Well, why would God have to lay hands on people? Can't you pray for people without laying hands on them? You can. Naaman didn't have to dip in that Jordan River either, did he? But that's where God told him to dip. <laughs> you do it God's way. You don't do it your way. And that's the way God said do it. And so we give you an opportunity so that, you know, you wouldn't have to call us to your home, but uh, you could come on a Sunday night and say, hey, I want prayer. I need prayer tonight. And you could come up and we'll just, if it's a man, we'll have our men gather around you. If it's a lady, we'll have our ladies gather around you and pray for you. Is there anyone tonight that needs to do that? I was looking at old Buffalo down here six months ago. We was praying whether he was going to live or not. Now he's down here praying for other people. Yeah. He's had the children's department praying for him for a long time. Okay, well, let's start tonight. I've got scriptures I can use. just depends on how much we talk and how much you share. But I want to begin by talking about a few things. I want to talk, I want to talk first of all, about something that's fresh and new and going on right now, and it's COVID. Uh, I know this week we had some folks in our church come down with COVID. Uh, we've had uh, Miss uh, Miss Patience. Miss Patience came down with COVID this week. Lisa Rice is down with COVID this week. Uh, Daniel and Felicia Altenberry came down with COVID this week. That's four people this this week. Again, I I, I think this strand of COVID. Ray and Charlotte Mears, y'all may have seen on Facebook, they came down with COVID this week. Uh, I think this strand, Stephen Wanda Davis just, just getting over it. Um, this strand is a, is a lot, at least it appears to be a lot weaker. It doesn't be as, it's not as strong. Sam was here this morning. Sam had a head cold. I said, Sam, 
And he wants, he's looking forward to Bible school. I took him home. I said, Sam, before you can come to Bible school tomorrow night, I want to know that you tested negative with COVID. So you can't be around the children without me knowing that. And not that I'm afraid that, you know, that uh, just anything, but I, I just can't think of a possibility of uh, let's don't help it spread. Let's don't do anything ridiculous that, that helps it spread. If you do have something that, you know, could be COVID, have it tested. COVID now don't sound don't seem the same as it did before. But you know, you might it, for you it might be a head cold, but for somebody else it might be life life ending. They can't handle they don't have the immunities that you have and they may not have the antibodies that you have. So think about others. And that's why I told Sam he's gonna have to get a clearance before I'm gonna let him come tomorrow night because I don't want him to spread anything if he happened to have it. So we just need to be smart. Let's just say that. If you're sick, go get tested. You know, sometimes, it, you know how it is this time of year. Sometimes it's just hay fever or it's allergies or something like that. Uh, but it could be COVID. It can look like that and still be COVID, and you could pass it on to somebody. So we just need to be wise about that. We may have that for a long time, you know. Uh, there's certain people in our nation I think want to make sure it hangs around. <laughs> They'd like for it to hang around every election time. But uh, anyway, uh, we, we realize that. So I, I, I say to you, uh, let's just be wise about that. Uh, it's not anything we necessarily, I don't think we, all the fear that they've put out there, I think so much of that's political and, and stuff. But, but yet there's people who are dying from this. People die from flu every year too. They die from a lot of things. But we just need to be smart. So that's one thing we've learned, hopefully, the last two years. Let's be smart. If you do have it, we'd still have masks out there. If you don't know, if you, if, you, if you just need think you need extra protection at the welcome desk, we do keep masks and hand cleaners, stuff like that out there. Okay? I just wanted to kind of give you that uh, announcement uh, for the church. Uh, the second thing I'd like to talk to you about uh, is obviously... Uh, the Southern Baptist Convention. I just got back from out there on that. If you have any interest about that, I will say to you, I, and the reason I've kind of waited to talk about it tonight is because, is because, Mom, what's wrong? You can't hear it? You can't hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, uh, I, I, hate to, I hate to try to tell it to 50 different people. 75 different people tell the same story, so I thought just have one time if you had any questions for me. But let me tell you what, what, kind of happened at the convention we we went out there we voted for you know new president new officers and all that uh, i didn't win anything you know i, I <laughs> the people that i kind of supported didn't win the things that that i had kind of hoped we would do as southern baptist um uh, but i kind of expected that it, it's california you know we went out there last year we had fifteen thousand messengers this year we had eight thousand so it was a lot fewer and, uh, and, and I want to say the people that got elected are not bad people, okay? It's not a war here. It's just a difference of theological philosophy of how we may just want to point the convention in a more, uh, a more conservative direction, and some may want to point it in a less conservative direction. Uh, and that's all it is. Uh, that doesn't sound like a big thing. It's not yet. But it could become a big thing. Uh, it could become something that um, we are really concerned about. Many people don't know the history of our convention. Many people do not know that 50 years ago, 50 years ago, the Southern Baptist Convention was pro-choice. We passed a resolution in a 1972 convention that said we were in favor of Roe v. Wade being the law of the land. Can you imagine? <laughs> Well, today, nobody wants that in the convention. We've totally turned, about, turned around. The, the, back then, the Bible was really under question. I mean, we had a commentary, the Broadman Bible commentary. I mean, they questioned the validity of the first five books of the Old Testament. I mean, they, they didn't believe the tree was real, the Garden of Eden was real, the you know, tree of life, tree of knowledge of evil. They didn't believe all those, all those things were real. They didn't believe Adam and Eve were real. They thought they were symbolic. So we've gone from that pro-choice 50 years ago to where we are today. 
wow, that's 180 degrees opposite directions. Okay, so, so all the news is not bad. It's not, but we see us taking baby steps back that direction. And every denomination does. You look at all, a lot of your other mainline denominations today, they've all taken steps back to the left. Starts with just a little bit, then they take another step. Rick Warren, kind of been one of our uh, Southern Baptist uh, emergent church guys over the last 40 years. He graduated seminary about the same time I did, about 40 years ago. He was at Southwestern. He left there, went to the most fertile place to plant a new church in Orange County, California, right out there where we had the convention. He planted a church called Saddleback Community Church. Everybody's heard of Rick Warren, right? The church now has, on an average Sunday, they'll have over 20,000 in attendance in about... 50 or 60 different locations. Um, the mega church, by the way, is going away. You're going to see a real re reduction in these big, 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 big churches. They're going now to having, you know, divide them up into 20 different campuses, start new churches in different communities, which I think is a good thing. If you're in a church with 10,000 people, your church is your Sunday school class. <laughs> That's all you know. You never know the pastor. You never know anything about him. But Rick Warren set out to create a, a unique church, a different church. And we said when it started, we said, he's a good guy. Rick loves the Lord. And a lot of people really attacked him. He, I thought he was a good guy. I love the Lord. But there's also a philosophy of teaching that says this. If the teacher believes this, now I, I believe this. But if the teacher believes this, which is Rick Warren, the guys who Rick Warren teaches and that follow him are going to believe this. And the guys that follow them are going to believe this. So it's the Bible plus some other things. Rick had just, um, just last year ordained three women as pastors in his church. He just stepped down and resigned and uh, put a husband and wife couple in as co-pastors of his church, which Rick would have never done himself 40 years ago. Now, women pastors is becoming an issue. It's one of those issues that may be an issue you have a question about. Why is that a problem? Well, the Bible clearly says in the book of Timothy when it describes the role of pastors and elders and stuff like that, it says uh, that the pastor is to be a man of one woman, man of one wife. Well, it used to be hard for a woman to be that, but now in the 2022, I'm not sure that we can arrange that some way or another, you know. But she's to be the husband of one wife. And she is not, you can say, it's just like a while ago, it's just like laying on of hands, it's like baptizing, you know, in the River Jordan. God says that a, the woman is not supposed to be the, not supposed to be, not to teach. Clearly it says, not to teach or usurp authority over the men. Okay? That's what we believe as Baptists. That's what the Bible says. Okay? Does that mean a woman can't speak in church? No, it doesn't mean that. There are groups out there that believe that. They believe that well, a woman can't even get behind the pulpit. No, we don't believe that. But what it basically says is that men step up and teach the men. Don't expect women to have to teach the men. And I believe it means that she definitely shouldn't be, a woman should not be the lead pastor of a church. She might... You know, and a lot of that people know the interpretation. That's the big argument right now is what does pastor mean? We literally had people make motions to, to have a study group study what pastor means in the Bible. I thought we knew all this time, Dale. I thought we had that figured out. But it's changed. In a lot of churches now, churches may have 20 different pastors. Well, which ones qualify? Which ones could women be? Which ones could they not be? So it's gotten pretty confusing. 
Um, to me, pastors typically, if I was going to call someone a pastor, I would want to ordain them, which meant they could share in all the ministries. They could preach to everybody. They could baptize. They could lead the Lord's Supper. They could do all those ordinances of the church. So, does anybody have a question about that topic? That is a big topic in our church, in our convention right now. Rick Warren? I, I, I really couldn't say what Rick does nowadays. He's officially retired. So, in fact, he said this would be his last convention. He got up and preached to us about how great their church was. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he said, we've trained 1.1 million preachers. Somebody figured it up. That was like 73 a day. <laughs> Graduate. It's just kind of a ridiculous number. They might have a question about anything I've mentioned so far. No questions? I just want you to know that's where I, I stand. I, I, I believe, I, I do believe, though, that uh, a lady... And, and boy, there's so many different views on this. I believe a lady can, I believe a man, if there are men in a Sunday school class, a man ought to teach that class. Or a couple, husbands and wife, as a couple could teach that class. But I think that husband needs to take the lead in that class. Men need to be taught by men. I just get that out of the Bible, crazy me. Okay? But there are positions, ladies' positions, that some people wouldn't like, I wouldn't mind calling a children's minister a children's minister if it's a lady. I wouldn't, that wouldn't bother me. Children's director, to me, children's director, children's minister is not a big deal. But it is a big deal to some people. Some people don't even think you should call a woman a minister because they have the old minister. I look at it as like, well, she's ministering. <laughs> Why not let her be called a minister? So I, I don't make that big of a deal out of it. My big deal is the lead pastor definitely needs to be a man. And if a woman has a role on that staff, she's definitely under the submissive. She is submissive to the pastor, the lead pastor of that church. So that's kind of where I, I stand on that issue. If you read much stuff, you follow Twitter, you follow Facebook, you're hearing all that kind of stuff out there now. And, and that's what it's about. We, uh, one of the few major denominations that now have not uh, basically just said, well, we don't care who preaches. We don't care if it's a man, if it's a woman, if it's a homosexual, if it's a straight person. We just don't care. Let somebody get up there and teach us something, you know. And we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. Speak up where everybody can hear you, okay? Yeah, there were some that were called prophetesses. Uh, they were prophetess, and there were some that were called deaconesses. Kind of okay. So the same people use that as uh, the word deacon literally means a servant. It's a position of a servant leader in a church, and I believe they were just some were referred to that because they served alongside. You know, they served in those churches. Um, prophetess is fine. I mean, I guess God used. Uh, prophets, some female prophets in the Bible, uh, I'm fine with that. It's not the role of pastor. It's not the role. Pa a prophet does this. A prophet says, here's what God said to me, and God told me to tell it to you. That was Old Testament before we had the Bible, before we had the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, we say, I can say the same thing, but it's because I read it in God's Word. The Bible says, God says in His Word, this is what you need to hear. Okay? So I don't just stand up here like Benny Hinn and say, Ooh, God told me. God told me. Benny Hinn one time said, God told me to tell y'all something new today. Y'all think there's three gods. Well, I think there's just one. But y'all think there's three gods. He said, God told me there's nine gods. That God the Father's in three, and God the Son's in three, and God the Holy Spirit's in three. There's really nine gods. Well, you big dummy, sit down. Sit down up there. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's probably after he blew some people down. 
But, so I'm just saying, that, that's what that role of prophet is. It says, I'm not limited by the Bible. I just say anything. Yeah. Anyway, God could do whatever he wanted to do in the Old Testament back there. So, all right. Any questions about that? Yes, ma'am. No, evangelist is a different office, actually. You know, I probably wouldn't have a problem with a female evangelist if she's evangelizing ladies. I don't have a problem with that. There should, could be a female evangelist, whether it's, you know, Miss Beth Moore or who's that other lady she does a lot of running with? Well, no. No, this other charismatic lady who's on there all the time. Joyce Myers, yeah, Joyce Myers, yeah. Yeah, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11, 12, and 13, it talks about those gifts. It says, the, it, it, in fact, it lists five gifts there, and, and two of those have actually gone now. Do you know that's not possible to be a, an apostle anymore? To be an apostle, you had to walk with Jesus, so you can't do that anymore, you know? Uh, but that one basically calls out the, the pastor, the evangelist, and I just went blank on the third one there. Is the three that are left. But basically, yeah. It, so that is definitely one of the gifts that are left today is the gift of evangelist. Okay? Would I bring a lady evangelist in here to preach to our church full of men and women? No, I wouldn't do that. But I'd bring her in here for a ladies' conference to speak to a ladies' conference. I'd be great with that. Why? Is that because I don't think she's good enough to speak to the men? No. God's got a man to do that. Step up, man. Step up. Be what God wants you to be. What are some of the other things you've heard about the convention that you maybe had a question about? Anything? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Well, that's another big area that I'm concerned about. When I hear J.D. Greer, who was the previous president, and then Ed Litton, the one who followed him, and I hear both of them. Of course, Ed tends to copy all of, of uh, J.D. Greer's sermons anyway. And so, anyway, but they both preach the same sermon and get up and say, the Bible's very quiet about, <laughs> about homosexuality. What is that? that? That's one step that says, let's don't worry about that sin. It's not blatant. It's not outpoured. But before long, the next group is going to come along and they're going to say, that's not really sin, is it? I read something the other day, the American Medical Association. <laughs> you know, that that's not really sin. Yeah, it's a sin. It's a sin in the sight of God. And we're quick to say amen on those, aren't we? We know that's a sin. But so is living together outside of marriage. A sin. And we can't just point out one. Let's point it all out. Had a young lady last week been coming to our church. Came to me and set me down and said, I, have, I need to reveal something to you. I've decided that it's okay to be bisexual. I like boys and girls. Are you okay if I still come to church? I said, you sure can come to church. I said, but until you get that right with God, you won't as a member, be accepted as a member of our church. That's beeping for some reason. And because, but the same thing would be true if a couple that's living together walked in here and said, I want to become a member of your church. I'd say, great. I hope you visit for a long time. But let's get that marriage thing right. And then you can become a member. You see, my fear is that we as Southern Baptists are more concerned about, and here's where I fear we're going, we're more concerned about what we can, what is interfering with me having a big crowd. Because if it's interfering with me having a big crowd, I want to get that out of the way. Is preaching on sin getting in the way of me having a big crowd? Some people think it is. Some yeah, some people think that's, that's a problem. 
You know, you can have a big pond that's about two inches deep. Or you can have a, spiritually speaking, we ought to be real deep, spiritually, not real shallow. And so because of that, I, this is a, that's one of those issues. It's not just homosexuality. It's, it's several things that we're just, we're beginning to see those baby steps in the wrong direction. And we're just trying to say, let's don't start in that direction. Let's go back in there. And the other thing is, we're seeing a big change in how we do missions. Southern Baptists do missions by uh, something called the cooperative program. Well... A lot of our leaders in years past, big churches, mega church pastors, didn't like putting their money in the, in the plate and giving it, and everybody shares and does cooperative missions. So they started something called um, Great Commission Giving. Now it's equal, same as a cooperative program. You can give to the cooperative program, or you can put your money in. I can give my money to a seminary. I can give my money to um, IMB. I can just pick where I want to give it. I can give my money to send a missionary across the world. And I can count that. If I gave it for missions, we're going to count that as great commission giving. It sounds okay, doesn't it? It sounds okay. Right? It sounds simple. No, nothing wrong with that. But that would be like, let me compare what that's like in our church. Everybody decided they weren't going to put their tithe in the church. Not just a tithe that goes in the general fund. I mean, Gary says, I'm going to give mine to the youth ministry. You know, David says, I'm going to give mine to the, uh, I'm going to give mine to help the senior adult ministry, being that he's one of our senior senior adults. <laughs> Dale says, I want to put mine in the Red Cross cripple ministry to help people like me. And before long, everybody picks out their ministry. Somebody wants to give to the music ministry. Somebody wants to give to the children's ministry. And before long, guess what? There's no money to pay the light bill. Because all the money given is designated here and there and here and there. And so we run into a little bit of a problem, but that's what they wanted. Can anybody here tell me how much money the cooperative program collects in a year? This is amount that comes in... This is just the amount that goes to Nashville. This ain't even statewide. It's around $400 million a year. And about half of that stays in the states to go with the state conventions. And about half of that goes on to the Southern Baptist Convention. So their budget up there is about $200 million for a year. It's nothing. You've, you consider, we got, we got over 3,000, close to 3,500 foreign missionaries and about 3,500 missionaries local that work in North America that we're funding. Imagine what it costs to keep one of them on the mission field for a year. It costs a lot. <laughs> uh, I, I would venture to say, time you give housing allowance and all that stuff, it, it's probably close to $100,000 a year per couple. Yeah. 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 Let me clarify though. Let me clarify. When I said hundred thousand dollars, that don't mean they pay them no hundred thousand dollar salary. Their salary is very basic, maybe thirty thousand dollars, something like that. All the other is health and living expense and place to live and all that kind of stuff. So um, not as much just money. So what that's going to begin to do is it's going to begin to drain some of that money. And then in the midst of all this, we've got the lawsuits. That's what's beginning, the sexual... We, we voted at the convention to, to adopt the report that came out from the Sex Abuse Task Force. Even though we, there are still questions... I've had to confront them on a couple things, that people that in there that shouldn't have been in there, and we've had it removed, and... But I'm saying to you that we just adopted it, said let's go on forward, see what the next step is. But I'm going to tell you the next step is there's lawsuits coming. There's people now going back, digging up things that happened to them 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, and saying, I'm going to sue about that. I'm going to sue about that. And they'll settle out of court with me. 
So my fear is that $200 million is going to disappear real quick. Um, the part that's paying it all is the part that I was a part of, the executive committee. And the executive committee, their budget's only $3 million a year. So it ain't like they got $200 million to play with. All that other money goes to the seminaries, the missionaries, and all that kind of stuff, okay? So just so you're aware, it ain't like they have all those tons of money to get rid of. I say all that to say this. We're going to have to make a decision at the end of this year when we develop a new budget. Are we going to be just cooperative program givers? Or are we going to say... You know, if, if our convention, it may not be this year, it might be next year, the year after that, which, let me, let me finish this thought and we'll come back. Somebody's going to ask me, somebody's thinking right now, well, are we going to stay in the Southern Baptist Convention or are we going to get out? I'm not for getting out, at least not right now. We do too much good. There's too much good that goes on in the Southern Baptist Convention to just throw in the towel. I, I think right now. And there may come a point, if it comes... It won't get close to where it was at in the 70s before I throw in the towel and say, I ain't being a part of that. But I think more and more churches are going to begin to say, okay, ERLC, you're doing a lot of liberal stuff. We're not going to pay your salaries. We, there's $3 million we're not going to give you. Or I, my church's money ain't going to go to it. Uh, we don't want to give to you. So we're going to give to whoever we want to. Of our six seminaries, Five of the six seminaries are teaching Calvinism. Calvinists dominated seminary. The only one that's not is New Orleans Seminary. Now, I know McClendon Baptist Church up here has decided they're going to give all their money that would have gone to seminaries to New Orleans Seminary. They're not going to divide it among the six because they're teaching something they don't believe in. So we're going to have to make some of those decisions. We're going to have to decide that. Um, we can decide to and it'll still count toward Great Commission giving. That's the thing about it. But it's going to hurt the cooperative program a little bit. My thoughts are this. I don't like what, in case you wonder what my thoughts are, I don't like what North American Mission Board's doing. They're doing a lot of things that I think they're wasting a lot of funds on a lot of things. Not everything's bad, but a lot of the churches that they're starting in these inner cities, they got women pastors, they got co pastors, husbands and wives co pastors in those churches. Well, that's not why we give money to go out and do something that the Baptist Faith Message says we shouldn't do. So we may not, I would probably encourage, I'm ready to say to North American Mission Board, we're not going to give to y'all. I'm about ready to say International Mission Board, where we got missionaries going around the world, I am willing to give there. I think that's a great place to give. Uh, I like what Chitwood, the president there, is doing. He's doing a super job. But we as a church are going to have to decide those kind of things over the next year or two. I want to see what's going to happen in New Orleans. Next year it's in New Orleans. The following year it's in Indianapolis. Next year it's back down like in Dallas or Atlanta, somewhere like that. I think over the next two or three years we're going to have a better understanding of where we're going as a convention. And if there's any chance of turning it around. Is it horrible? No, it's not. It's just baby steps in the wrong direction, I think. I see. Because we've been here. We've been through this. We're putting people in leadership positions that weren't even Baptist ten years ago. There's a big movement to follow. Um, I don't know how to say it any other way other than kind of like CRT, critical race theory, that you get put in leadership positions on some of these committees if you're black, if you're Asian, if you're Hispanic. If you're a white guy, you're out. You're out because we got to make up for past mistakes. Folks, I wasn't involved in all those things people's making up for 150 years ago, 100 years ago. And I can't do enough to make up for what they did, for the wrongs from back then. And so I, I just, that's the part that bothers a lot of us. It's just that these days and time, we've got people who don't know where we've been that we're putting in leadership positions. And listen, if you don't know where we've been, you don't know where we need to go. And that's my fear is that we're doing that. If we, don't, if we don't, we're putting people that don't have a clue about what it means to be a Southern Baptist, what we've done to reach the world, and we're just saying, well, you look like you'd be a good person because the color of your skin, we're going to put you in a position. And that's just kind of, and that's being, a, I'm saying it in an extreme kind of way. It's not that they're not good people. It's not that they're not 
involved in Baptist life, but they haven't been around and seen what we've gone through since the 70s and 80s, what we had to do to save this convention. I'm going to be honest with you, we had to save this convention. This convention was going by the wayside. And so, any questions? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what it is. It, let, me, let me give a better word for maybe than critical race theory. It's kind of a quotas thing. It's kind of a quotas. Everything's got to be done on percentages. Every time they announce well, who's on this committee, who's on that committee, there's this percent of this color and this percent of this color and this percent of women and this percent of the... It's all about quotas, you know, and meeting some kind of quota. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not there yet because I think we can turn it around. And we can't turn it around if we leave out of it, you know. It, it, you can't fight it with it from, you can't try to correct it from the outside. And I'm going to tell you all, I've been very proud to be a Southern Baptist for, for a long time. And I just don't think we give up on that. We've got six seminaries. We could, you know, I'd like to, if it was ever going to come a time that we have to part ways, I'd like to see some of those seminaries go with us, you know, to help train people in what we believe. But I, I'm just not ready to say no yet. I, I, don't think the, I don't think the path is that clear. I could see us making a few adjustments. <clears throat> I'd even say it maybe instead of some of that money we're doing North American Missions, y'all know we're doing some stuff now in Zambia, and I've got a chance now to plant another church. We've got another church in North Zambia that wants to be planted, a Baptist church. And... Uh, we could take some of the money that we're putting in missions and put it in open-door missions and plant another church, build another church if we want to. So there's some options out there, some things. We still missions, but we'll, we'll just think about that. I, I, God hadn't led me to, do, to, to recommend that we do anything yet, but I'm not ready to bail. I'm not ready to jump out. I'm ready to see if we can save this thing. And there's a lot of people trying to do that. So question, another question before we close. Okay. Even with the bad, we are still the largest evangelical organization in the world. Being that, what's the cost of the church? With all of its bad and its ugly, all of the needy, needing people to Christ, we still got to fight. We still have to take a stand. But I'm, I'm like Brother Mike. Why? Yeah, we, we can do more together than we can do individually. And that's what the cooperative program has always been about. We can do more together with other churches than we can on our own. We can't train people. If we send somebody to Africa, we can't train them to speak that language. We don't have that ability, but they do. So we, we support that. Um,
You're right. But at the same time, we can't turn our eyes away and say, well, it don't matter. It don't matter. You know, uh, I, I remember from back in the main conservative, right, the main con, the conservative resurgence, uh, guy wrote a book. He said, a hill to die on. What is a hill to die on? The Word of God is a hill to die on. But let's make sure, like I say, if this is in, in line with the Word of God, Southern Baptists in the 70s were way over here. <laughs> it was real clear. The problems were real clear. They didn't believe the Bible. They didn't believe the miracles of the Bible. Um, and we were able to pull our convention back over here. We're not over there. We're, we're right here. Okay? And every, about every 40 to 50 years, a convention has to decide whether it's going to stay with the Word or drift away. We just, those who've been here a while, see the drift. Those who are new and coming on, they don't see it. They're part of the drift. <laughs> and so... Mm-hmm. Yeah, there were a lot bigger issues, I think, back in Nashville. We were trying to decide about the sex abuse, and all that had blown up in the last week before we got there. And then there had been the critical race theory, trying to bring that out public. and So there was a lot bigger issues back in Nashville, I think, than there were out there. Um, I guess my point being, we just need to keep our eyes open like I preached this morning. Let's stay alert. And here's the good news. Every Southern Baptist church is autonomous. It don't matter what they do up there. They can do whatever they want. They have no say-so over what we do. Other than if we, got, if we went crazy, they could kick us out. You know, if we start doing some of the things that we're against, they could kick us out. They could say, you're not going to be a Southern Baptist anymore. But uh, that's not going to happen. But we... They can pass rules. They can decide they won't do this, won't do that. It ain't got nothing to do with us. We do what we want to do. You, the Washtenaw Baptist Church is in charge of Washtenaw Baptist Church, not, not the SBC. But if we're going to send them money, along with that money comes accountability. It's just like when you give us money, you hold us accountable. When we send them money, we want to hold them accountable, and we want to use it the best way we possibly can. All I'm saying to you is we're going to keep our eyes open over the next two, three, four years, and we're going to be watching. And if they start doing things that we think are not biblical, you're going to see some new things happen. It may be forming a new convention. It may be different things that happen, but we'll make that decision. Okay? Let me read a scripture to you. I can't, I can't let y'all leave without a scripture. And by the way, I'm working on a child abuse uh, prevention aware and awareness thing for our church. Um, just kind of some more rules and things that we may want to follow in our children's department, in our youth department. Just about people that work in there and and just making sure that they've passed background checks and making sure that we're as safe as we can possibly be with our security. And I really appreciate our security team. Some of you don't know, we've had, you know, with the abortion issue and with the uh, gay, queer, straight, lesbian, whatever all of it is nowadays, uh, all that issue going on. I mean, this church has got people walking in peeling their clothes off. they got people walking in pouring blood on themselves. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff. Our security team, we had about five people armed this morning walking around but checking these doors. We have one that stays over in the children's department just to make sure those kids are okay. We have a marriage that was in trouble, that's in trouble and they're squabbling and there was the possibility of that blowing up this morning. You just don't realize what goes on around this little bitty corner here in West Washtenaw Parish. But you need to know something. We try to be prepared for those things and watch for those things. Okay? Colossians 3, I want to read you two verses, first two verses. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above 
where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind. This is one of the verses I'm going to have us memorize one Sunday. Set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. How do you live the strong Christian life? How do you overcome every day? It begins in your mind. If you think about worldly things, you'll be drawn. James says you'll be drawn away and enticed toward those worldly things. But our minds must be must be filtered by the Holy Spirit to wash out those things which are not of God. Okay? So these, this whole chapter talks about the importance of concentrating our mind Then he moves into controlling the mem- your members of your body. Salvation is something that God does. It's not just a, not just a process that, oh, well, I got saved. It's all over. No, it's kind of like getting married. The easiest thing about a marriage is that day that you got married. Then the hard part starts the next day. <laughs> learning to live together. Two people learning to be one. That's the hard part. That's the way salvation is. It's real easy walking down front getting saved. But the hard part starts the next day. Y'all see Larry laughing back there and... Larry will tell all of y'all, Larry, come up and testify how hard it is. How hard it is after the first wedding ceremony day. (laughs) Oh, me. I know it. Don't, Miss Dawn. That'd be be nice. That'd be ugly. It's so important that the next few days you begin to think about, how am I going to stop doing those things that I shouldn't be doing? I'm doing some things I shouldn't be doing. That God's not happy with. How do I stop that? It all begins in your mind. If you get control of this, and I know people say, well, that's brainwashing. Well, not really. It's not brainwashing, but uh, the Bible does say that we need to be washed by the water of the Word. Word needs to wash out a lot of that garbage in your mind. And when you get your mind fixed on Christ, you'll think more about how to please Him and how to please your flesh. And it goes on and talks about that. All that part is there about your, how that you and I have to, the next three words, for you died. You died. Get that in your mind. Get that in your mind. You're dead. Now what? Christ living in me part. Get that part right. Christ living in me. What's that look like? And how can I have the power to do that? And we'll talk about that some when we come back next Sunday night. Well, no, next Sunday night we got July 3rd stuff. But when we come back on this. All right, let's stand and we'll be dismissed. I hope it didn't disappoint any of you just talking a little bit about the convention and COVID and the sex abuse task force, all that stuff. All that stuff's going to work out. I don't know how it's going to work out, uh, but it's going to work out. God's going to work it out day by day. day day. But I want you to be aware of what's going on. And uh, and, uh, thankfully, hey, praise the Lord, I'm through. I'm through having to go to Nashville, so I don't have to do that three times a year and meet with the convention. Here's what I'm committed to the next the next. The rest of my life, I'll be 62 this year. Here's what I'm committed to the rest of my life. Apart from taking care of my cows. I ain't, but Jerry, I ain't talking about taking care of my cows, all right? But that's just a known deal. Taking care of my family and taking care of my cows, that's up front. You know, got to have to take care of the farm. But three ministries I want to focus all my energy on. First of all, being your pastor. I want all my energy to be on this church. Number two, the Baptist school. Northeast Baptist school there in West Monroe that I... Helped plant, what, 27, 28 years ago. And uh, I want, I'm back on that, involved in that, helping with that. I wish I, I, I just, I would give you a little clue. We have been given another campus. Twice the size of the campus we have now. Just a few miles away from the campus we have now. And in the very near future, we're going to have two campuses. We're going to have a high school, middle school, high school campus, and we're going to have an elementary campus. And it's a 
$4 million donation project given to the school for a new location. We'll be able to enroll up to 600 students with these two locations. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And, but I'm committed the rest of my days to help make that happen. And then the third thing is Open Door Missions where we're still doing mission work in Zambia and Zimbabwe. We got a $2,000 donation to a work in Zimbabwe, which is just right across the river from Zambia, where we're doing that work and, uh, this week. And so we're going we're gonna to start pumping some money into a ministry there in Zimbabwe. That's some big stuff. That's big stuff we can do. And that's where I'm going to put the rest of my life in those three areas. Okay? All right. I know some of you say, he don't look like he's going to be 62. Some of you are saying, yeah, it looks like 72 to me. But anyway, let's, let's, uh, let's close at this time. Todd, how about you close us?